Thank you all for coming out um, in all the rain. Uh, my name is Alelia Bundles. I'm a trustee, a Columbia trustee. I am a uh, I'm co-chair of the strategic plan planning process for 2023 for the Columbia Alumni Association, and I'm a graduate of the journalism school a really long time ago. <laughs> Though I feel as young as anybody who's here in the room. But so I have seen a lot of changes. When I first started driving, I could put a dollar's worth of gas in my parents' car and drive for the weekend. Um, and at that point, BYOB meant only bring your own bottle, not bring your own bag for shopping. Um, recycling was not a part of what we did. So we have come a really long way. Um, and at the same time, we know the science now, but we have more people who deny the science. So we're in a, in a very interesting place. And Columbia has been a leader for a very long time in uh, climate science. So I'm just going to show you a quick video. You're right. You're a tree frog, a sea turtle, a human being, or a ficus tree. If you live anywhere on this planet, then this message is for you. We're with you. At a time when the effects of climate change are accelerating, but support for climate research is wavering, Columbia University remains more committed than ever to finding solutions. We're at work every day. The largest community of leading climate scientists in the world, along with experts in public health, policy, urban design, and other fields, all working around the world, all focused on climate. Together, we connect the dots to make breakthroughs grounded in both science and human needs. We're focusing on lowering CO2 levels, addressing sea level rise, and predicting extreme weather. We're providing tools for today's leaders to make better decisions around the globe. And we're teaching students to aspire to a better world. We are earth scientists, climate forecasters, oceanographers, health experts, lawyers, and social scientists. We are Columbia University, and we know that climate solutions are possible. For decades, we have led the way, and with your support, we'll continue. The Columbia commitment to climate response is a five-year sprint to solve urgent and complex challenges. This is our commitment to you and to our shared future. So I hope that inspired you a little bit. This is part of Columbia's overall Columbia commitment. So it's one of the seven pillars of this campaign to raise money that will, from donors and from volunteers, that will support our faculty and support our students so that we stay on the cutting edge. So climate response, uh, one of the seven, along with arts and ideas, the things that you were hearing about yesterday, just societies, data and society, global solutions, precision medicine, and the future of neuroscience. So our university campaign goes from July 1st, 2016, it's already started, through July 30th, 2021. And we hope that by making you a part of the conversation, giving you the tools and the vocabulary you need to talk about a topic like climate response, that you're able to participate in a meaningful way in the conversations. If somebody tells you it's a communist plot, you'll have an answer for them. <laughs> You know, and that you'll also be able to be leaders in the conversation. And so today we're going to focus on science and solutions and inspiration and how we can find some optimism around this topic even when, it's, even when we're in challenging times. We're fortunate to have three of the world's leading climate scientists on our faculty uh, at Columbia. And just to give you a little bit more background, I believe that you, if you haven't already picked up one of these pages on climate response, uh, you will find them outside. It's a really great cheat sheet to study uh, and to be able to have this conversation. I'm going to keep this in my wallet so that, <laughs> so that, I, can, so that I can talk about climate science in, in a meaningful way because I am not the science girl. Um, but I think that, the, that part of what we will hear today will give us all 
the ability to understand some of the basic science uh, of climate change. But climate change is um, the greatest challenge that we have faced on our planet. Uh, it is something that uh, Columbia is studying. We'll be able to hear wonderful, I mean, very important comments from Kate Marvell, Bradley Horton, and Peter Domenicall today. This will give you a chance to educate yourselves so that you will be able to have intelligent conversations. So at this point, it's my pleasure. Did I leave anything out yet, Doreen? Keep me honest. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce Kate Marvell. And am I saying that correctly? Marvel. Marvel, okay, like the comic books. Okay, even better because her website is marvelclimate.com. So check it out. <laughs> she is a climate scientist. Um, her research focuses on how human activities affect the climate and what we can expect in the future. She uses satellite observations, computer models, and basic physics to study the human impact on a range of variables from rainfall patterns to cloud cover. Kate. All right, so thank you so much for coming out here on um, what is not a very beautiful day. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about hurricanes lately, as I think almost everybody in the country has. And you know what was a beautiful day was Puerto Rico the day before Hurricane Maria. Um, and I just can't stop thinking about what it would have been like to live in Puerto Rico 200 years ago before modern science. And you would have had no idea what was about to hit you. And I, I feel really fortunate to live in the modern world where we do know what's coming, and we can take action, and we can plan for it. We know it's coming because we have satellites that can see the planet from outer space. That blows my mind. I think that's amazing. And we also know what's coming because we have sophisticated computer models that allow us to predict the tracks of storms and take appropriate action. So I'm really grateful to live in the modern world where we have these tools at our disposal. Now, I am not a meteorologist. I don't study weather, and hurricanes certainly aren't my specialty. But I do study what I consider to be a natural disaster. It's a slow-moving natural disaster, and it's going to affect every single one of us. Um, I'm a climate scientist, and I study climate change. Um, and people expect me, I think, to be more depressed on a day-to-day -day basis <laughs> than I am. Um, but I think I have the best job in the world. I have the best job in the world because I get to study the best planet in the world. Sorry, Mars, this is way better. <laughs> And I get to use these amazing tools that modern science has put at our disposal. We have a century, Peter as a paleoclimatologist is gonna yell at me for saying we have only a century of measurements, but we have measurements of the Earth's temperature that stretch back to before the Industrial Revolution. And we have three decades of satellite measurements that let us study how the climate's changing from space. Not only that, but we have sophisticated computer models of the climate. Let's see if I can get this to play. Um, oops. Um, the, upper button. the upper button. We have sophisticated computer models of the climate that let us study how things like dust and sea salt and the aerosols released when forests burn down circulate throughout the atmosphere. So just like meteorologists, weather scientists, we have access to the tools of modern science. And that makes me optimistic, because that will help us, I think, make good decisions in the future. So all of these observations and our climate models are telling us one thing, one very basic thing. It's getting warmer. And we predict that it will get warmer in the future. And as a climate scientist who does a lot of public outreach and science communication, the number one question that I get is, well, how do we know it's our fault? How do we know that human actions have anything to do with this warming that we've experienced so far? So what's really warming the world? Is it the fact that human emissions have caused atmospheric carbon dioxide levels to skyrocket? And the cool thing about this 
is we can use climate models. We have put the planet on a computer, and we can use that to create scenarios of the world without us, the world that might have been. So for example, changes in solar variability, the output of the sun, we know what those have looked like, and those cannot reproduce the warming that we've observed. Volcanoes, they make it cooler when a volcano goes off, but recovery from volcanic eruptions cannot explain the warming we've observed. And so if you combine all of these natural factors together, they simply can't explain what we see. Humans have changed the composition, the land use of the planet. We've depleted ozone. We've emitted what we call tropospheric aerosols, gas and dust that block the sun, air pollution. And we've also been emitting greenhouse gases. And if you combine these human factors together, greenhouse gases, aerosols, ozone depletion, and changes that we've made to the surface of the land. That is what allows us to explain the warming we've seen so far. So we developed this visualization um, with Bloomberg News, um, and it's gotten, I think, several million, like in the hundreds of millions of hits, and won a bunch of um, data journalism awards. Um, and I think this is a great example of a collaboration between scientists and journalists to tell a story in a really, really clear and intuitive way. <clears throat> So the number two question that I get when people hear that I'm a climate scientist is, OK, it's getting warmer. Who cares? And you know, like, I actually think this is a really good question. Because what we're talking about here, when you see that temperature going up, that's the average temperature of the entire planet. And nobody experiences the average temperature of the whole planet. It's about 60 degrees. That's fairly pleasant. And um, I'm from California, so during a New York winter, a few degrees of warming sounds like a really good idea. So I think it's a reasonable question. What does global warming mean? And so it's not just temperature. And this is what a lot of my research focuses on. We have already observed the fingerprints of human activity and those characteristic signatures of climate change in things like melting glaciers, changes in snow cover, um, air temperatures up in the atmosphere, um, melting ice sheets, warming oceans. Um, and we've seen these things even in biology. Species are migrating poleward and upward. Spring is coming earlier, and that's affecting plant physiology. So climate change is not just about temperature. It touches on a lot of the things that we care about. In particular, it changes the humidity of the atmosphere. Warmer air holds more water vapor. And that means that the rainstorms that are affected by climate change have more rain to dump on us. And that is why intense rainfalls, like we saw in Hurricane Harvey, are a fingerprint of climate change. The oceans are getting warmer. And warmer oceans are hurricane food. They provide that energy that drives those intense storms. Sea levels are rising. And as the sea level rises, that means storm surges are getting worse. So we can never say climate change caused any particular storm. And if anybody tells you that we didn't have hurricanes before climate change, you shouldn't believe them. That's not true. But the way that I like to think about it is in terms of Lance Armstrong. So Lance Armstrong is a very good bike rider. I would be willing to bet Lance Armstrong could beat me in almost every race. However, Lance Armstrong won seven Tours de France. And we have evidence that he was doping while he did that. And so we can never say that doping or a particular combination of stuff in Lance Armstrong's blood won the Tour de France for him. But we can say it probably loaded the dice. And that's what climate change is doing. Climate change is not causing hurricanes. And it's really difficult to say that any one particular event is attributable to climate change. But what climate change is doing is it's creating these conditions, more hurricane food, more water vapor in the atmosphere, increased sea levels. It's creating those conditions that load the dice and make these events more likely and more devastating when they do happen. So the third question that I get when people know that I'm a climate scientist is, OK, how, how bad is it going to get? How freaked out should I be? And the answer is kind of embarrassingly, we don't know. There's still a lot of science to be done here. So a lot of my work focuses on reducing this uncertainty, 
So this range comes from the projections of different computer models of the climate. We have to use models to look at the future because unfortunately we don't have any time machines. And if we did, we would just send a graduate student to the future, have them make some measurements and report back. Um, so if anybody would like to fund that, please come talk to me. Um, so instead, we have to rely on what computer models are telling us. And every single one of these models is telling us that it's going to get warmer. But there's a range. They're not all telling us it's going to get warmer at the same rate, or we're going to pass the two degree threshold at the same time. And we know the reasons for this. We know the reasons for this because climate change, turns out, is very complicated. Because this magnificent planet that we all live on has many things happening at once. So for example, when it gets warmer, the planet responds to that warming, triggering things that we as scientists like to call feedback processes. For me, the most intuitive and easy to understand feedback process is something called the ice albedo feedback. So ice is shiny. It reflects a lot of light back to space. And so the planet, if we had no ice, we would actually be warmer. But as the planet warms up, that ice starts to melt. And so areas that were once covered by this really effective reflective coating and reflected that sunlight back to space now expose darker land or ocean underneath. So it's like changing from wearing something reflective on a hot day to wearing a heavy black sweater that absorbs a lot more heat. So as the ice melts, this sets off a feedback process where the climate, in response to warming, melts ice, and that, in turn, enhances the warming. So that's an example of the complexities that arise in studying the climate system. For me personally, one of the most interesting complexities is what clouds are going to do. In large part, that picture, where it showed that different models did not agree on how warm it was going to get, that is because different climate models don't agree on what clouds are going to do in the future. And even though I'm from California, and I hate weather, and I really hate clouds, I find myself drawn to studying them because clouds actually are the major source of uncertainty in our climate predictions for the future. But I want to emphasize that uncertainty is not the same thing as ignorance. We don't know everything, but we don't know nothing. So I feel like the continued existence of science, the fact that we're still asking questions, doesn't invalidate science. It doesn't mean that we don't know anything. And for me personally, I feel like this planet is a place worth studying and it's a place worth saving. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Kate. I think one of my quotes of the day is going to be, uncertainty is not the same as ignorance. So when people tell you, well, we just don't know, well, nobody knows. Well, some of us know some things. <laughs> what was the link for the um, Bloomberg? Um, what's really warming the world? OK, perfect. All right, uh, that, that will be going on to my Twitter feed and my Facebook page. Some of you who are uh, more active on Instagram can put it on Instagram than I. Yes? And also, I'll say something that Kate won't say, that she did all the science behind that. Not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so now it is my pleasure to be able to, to introduce Radley Horton another climate scientist on Columbia's faculty. We really are in the lead on this. We love that. Uh, he's at Lamont Doherty, uh, also NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Among his most recent publications, because when you Google him and you find his long, long list of publications, so I will just mention the most recent, uh, Arctic Sea Ice and its Role in Global Change. His research focuses on extreme weather events, the limits of climate models, and adaptation to climate change. Radley Horton. Thank you all for the chance to be here today and uh, speak to you. I'm going to use my time to talk a little bit um, about tipping points, um, hitting some of the themes that, that Kate has already uh, mentioned. 
Um, I'll start with, by talking a little bit about my own experience um, and a sort of personal tipping, tipping point that, that I experienced as a result of my time uh, at Columbia. I did my graduate work at Columbia and Lamont um, and under the leadership um, of a lot of cutting edge scientists, including Cynthia Rosenzweig from NASA GIS, um, a really instrumental figure in getting New York City to think not just about their greenhouse gas emissions reductions, but the need to think about adaptation at an early stage. So the timing was right, that I was basically finishing my graduate work right around the time when New York City was in some ways persuaded, I would say, to think about their vulnerabilities to climate change uh, in lockstep with the efforts they were already making to be a leader uh, in greenhouse gas emissions reduction. So I'll tell quickly a little bit about that story. We started out, I would say, in a linear mode of thinking, which is often, I think, the best way to start out, to first order, try to understand a system and estimate the risks by thinking in a linear uh, way. So what do I mean by a linear approach? I mean that we started out um, thinking about average changes in climate variables. So as Kate was saying, this is how is average global temperature going to change? How is average sea level going to change? Um, and to New York City's credit, from the beginning, when we were talking about those average long-term changes, they encouraged us to think a little bit about what we call the tail risk, the possibility of outcomes that are maybe outside of, of the central range of climate models, so that we could prepare if we're thinking about truly fail-safe systems that we need to have last for 100 years, considering some worst-case scenarios or near-worst-case scenarios that, while they might not seem like the most likely outcomes, if they were to happen, they'd be so catastrophic that we, we want to prepare for them to some extent. Um, so we move forward with sea level rise projections, average temperature projections. Now at the same time, we already realize that it's the extreme weather events um, that really have the biggest impacts um, on our systems, on our, on our bodies, on the infrastructure that we've built, for example, on our ecosystems. So we tried simultaneously to say, what's going to happen to these extremes? The frequency of heat waves, the frequency of heavy rain events, the frequency of coastal flooding. At that time, though, the science was not there for us to delve deeply into the key processes behind heat waves, behind how hurricanes might affect, say, the Northeast. So what we did instead is we took a simpler approach. We just looked at the historical weather data the historical distribution of temperatures, historical distribution of rainfall. And we said, with a few degrees of warming, with a little bit of sea level rise, how often will the frequency of these extreme events change and their severity? We didn't delve under the hood a lot. The science wasn't there. We just said, if you shift the averages, and if you assume the distribution stays the same, what happens? Um, we were very careful to caveat. Let's mention the limitations in the approaches, but still, the sort of first order findings, I think, were pretty profound and arguably even 10 years later are what New York City is emphasizing the most. And just to quickly highlight a couple of those examples, even if we get lucky on sea level rise, even if we just have two, two and a half feet of sea level rise, and even if hurricanes don't change at all, if we continue to get the storms of the past, just raising that sea level baseline by two feet or so, two and a half feet, will mean that the level of coastal flooding, the high water levels that used to happen once every 100 years, will be happening within the lifetime of the typical mortgage, every 20 or 30 years or so, without any stronger storms. And of course, that also means with that sea level that when you get an event like Sandy, the ocean's a foot higher than it was 100 years ago. So if that same storm had hit 100 years ago, even if we had the population and the infrastructure of today, if the sea was a foot lower, 80,000 fewer people would have experienced flooding in their homes. So small shifts in the averages matter. That two degrees of warming that we've observed globally, two degrees Fahrenheit, has already shifted the frequency of extreme events dramatically. As we look to the future, if we get lucky on temperature and just have a few degrees of warming, New York City is going to have about three times as many days uh, with temperatures above 90 or 95 degrees than it has in the past longer durations of heat waves, and more intense, pushing our systems uh, more and more. Um, but that was a linear approach that we took to extremes, just considering how averages might change. We also, working with New York, really were, I think, um, at the cutting edge of what we call the kind of stakeholder engagement approach, sitting down with the decision makers from the beginning and asking, what climate variables matter for you today? What are the action points? Is it when temperatures go above a certain amount? 
Um, is it a certain amount of rainfall that causes combined sewer overflow events, for example? We sat down with decision makers and the city lined up work groups around communication, transportation. We rolled up our sleeves and had the meetings where we said, for each of these climate variables, how will it impact your system? It was very powerful stakeholder engagement, but it was a very linear um, approach. So why do I keep talking about this linear approach? Because you know, at some point along the lines, we started to realize the limitations of this thinking. It's a great first order approach. It helps you see and understand risk. But there's a lot of possibilities out there in the climate system, um, in our social systems, that really need to be thought about in a nonlinear way. We need to get beyond climate science. Uh, we need to leverage some of the biggest advances in climate science of recent years. So I'll tell a little bit about that story now, um, sea level rise. I said that New York City from the beginning was amenable to thinking about extreme sea level rise. That proved to be a very prescient approach because in the last 10 years, we basically had one awakening after another of all the surprises in how sea levels can change, how the ice sheets especially, that ice that's sitting on land can surprise us. You know, we tend to think that in science we come up with, you know, through physical modeling, the key developments of how a system is going to change. And that's often the case. But with sea ice, excuse me, with land-based ice um, in Greenland and West Antarctica, we've largely actually been watching, um, we're, we're observing in real time, very fine spatial scales, all these sort of sinister ways that an ice sheet can start to fall apart and make its way to the ocean. Our observation, the observations, which Lamont and Columbia are leading in, are actually leading to a better understanding of the physical processes. Our ability to model is coming out of what we're observing. We've been observing how parts of these ice sheets um, have actually depressed the land underneath them, so that if those ice sheets start to fall apart at the boundary between the ocean and the land, you can have runaway processes because, for just to give one example of this, a lot of the ice sheets actually extend out with sort of a tongue into the water. If the ocean water is warm, as we're observing, it can essentially thin that tongue of ice and you basically lose that protective dam that's holding the water back. If that dam gets thin enough, the water is actually able to override and because of the huge weight of the ice that's historically depressed some of that land, if that water can clear that lip, it actually can flow downhill. Runaway processes that we didn't understand um, until we started to observe some of these things happening. So we need to think about the limitations of models at the same time from a risk framing perspective, engaging broader sets of experts and key observations to try to really understand the full range of outcomes. That's the story about mean change, how much sea level could change. We heard from Kate about how much temperature, average temperature, could change. Then there's the story of extremes themselves. I started out saying we didn't initially have the science to look at the key processes. How are heat waves modeled? What's actually happening during a heavy rain event? We just shifted the average, shifted the whole distribution. That's changed a lot in the five or 10 years, in the last five or 10 years. We're now in place at Columbia with leading scientists in many of these aspects to really delve deeply into how these extreme events work. And with a change in climate, what are we going to observe? Just to give one example of that, um, heat waves. So much research in the last several years now suggesting that we might not get the weather of the past. It might not just be that we have the same frequency of high pressure systems, the same jet stream pattern that we had in the past. Even if we did have the same weather of the past with higher temperatures, heat waves would be longer duration and more severe. But what if it's actually worse than that? What if the distribution changes? What if all these interactions in the system, some of the loss of ice potentially, sea ice in the Arctic that Kate mentioned, actually changes the jet stream in a way where these high pressure systems associated with heat waves, associated with drought, start to last longer don't move as quickly from west to east and sort of clear out as they have in the past? What if the high pressure is more intense? What if the atmosphere changes in a way that makes heat waves even worse than what climate models can currently tell us? What if there are changes in the surface? Um, Lamont scientists have been leaders in studying soil moisture interactions with the atmosphere. And they're starting to realize 
that when we, in parts of the world where soil moisture is not too high and not too low, sort of Goldilocks amounts of soil moisture, there can be very powerful positive feedbacks, like Kate described with sea ice, whereby if temperatures warm a little bit due to more carbon dioxide, more greenhouse gases, it actually causes the soil moisture to drop. That temperature evaporates some of that moisture, which thereby makes it easier for additional warming to happen. And as you get that additional warming, it can take more soil moisture out. There can be a runaway process. Climate models are not good at capturing these things. They're not complete tools to enable us to estimate all the things that could happen. We need process-based expertise. We need observational scientists. We need paleoclimatologists. All these sources of information that, that Columbia and Lamont um, specialize in to address these um, and other types of risks. We're also learning to think about extreme events not in isolation, right? We can't just think about the heat wave in one place. What if with higher temperatures we're simultaneously getting more heat waves and droughts in different parts of the world? Maybe in the breadbasket regions of the world. How close are we to some key societal impacts in terms of food security, food availability? if we're seeing a situation where some of these extreme events are actually correlated in space. So the risk of simultaneous heat waves goes up. Or maybe it's that the events are correlated in time. Maybe certain parts of the world in the future are gonna be more vulnerable to getting back-to-back -back nor'easters, back-to-back hurricanes, for example. Those are all examples of why we need to have a nonlinear approach to the thinking. Um, and I think we also need to extend that type of approach into our thinking about impacts uh, as well. Because just like uh, our climate models can't tell us all the key physical processes, a lot of our impact models um, have similar features. They might perform pretty well over the types of temperatures we've experienced in the past. But can we really understand with climate change how the risk of crop failures is going to go up as we start to see temperatures on individual days or beyond anything that's been experienced in the past? The further we push the climate system, before, the further we push some of these other systems we're modeling, like infrastructure, food, public health, the bigger the potential for surprises, the bigger the risk. So it's a real challenge how do we develop modeling approaches at the cutting edge that enable us to be prepared for some of those kind of worst case um, scenarios. That's a whole new kind of science, and Columbia is very well positioned to lead there as well because the expertise is so deep, goes so far beyond the climate science public health work that we're doing um, around how heat waves affect people. Uh, as those temperatures go higher, there are nonlinear impacts in terms of human vulnerability. If temperatures and humidity get too high, it doesn't matter how good a physical condition you're in. It doesn't matter if you have an endless supply of water. You actually start to come up against thermodynamic limits of the body's ability to cool itself. In various parts of the world, how are people going to be able to do outdoor labor? How are they going to be able to farm? Um, in situations where you can't have air conditioning as those temperatures and humidities uh, rise. Columbia's in a great place to model um, those and many other types of, of sort of impact assessment uh, kind of systems. Um, so really we're talking here um, about risk management and uncertainty. Um, this sort of modeling approach about thinking about simultaneous extreme events in different parts of the world, worst case scenario outcomes, really, I think, needs to be applied to all our systems. New York City has been a great place to work, right? We have financial resources available for adaptation, for greenhouse gas mitigation. We have a political climate where you can talk about climate change. And compared to some parts of the world, we have a geography that makes it a little easier to adapt, you could argue, than, say, South Florida, um, with extensive low-lying areas. But even a city like New York, can it really fully understand the systemic risks is the biggest threat to our real estate, um, to insurance markets, going to come from what the ocean does right here? Is it going to be the storm that actually hits New York? Or are there systemic risks all along the coast? Are insurance markets going to fail because of a sequence of storms in other parts of the world, for example? Um, is there going to be a perception shift um, in terms of real estate values? How do we prepare for some of these kind of things? Um, these are huge challenges, and again, we've got to go way beyond climate science to start to address them. We have to engage that broader community of experts at Columbia. We have the legal scholars thinking about adaptation. We have um, the social scientists. We have the communicators um, who are getting people to understand risk, be able to talk about risk. What ways of talking about risk resonate most with different types of communities? Columbia is leading in all these uh, areas. Engagement with the private sector, the role of business as sort of a key lever 
um, and getting us to, to understand and be able to talk about um, some, of these, some of these emerging uh, risks. So, so far I've mostly been talking about pretty negative story really about the dangers of a changing climate and the vulnerability of all the systems we care about, our food systems, our public health, uh, to those climate changes. And I think you really can make a case that there are maybe tipping points out there that will be very hard for us as a society to respond to. That's why it's so urgent that we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions dramatically. And Columbia has so much leadership uh, in that area, whether it's innovations to actually capture carbon and pull it out of the atmosphere, whether it's the legal scholars turning up the pressure on some of the corporations and countries that are responsible for the most emissions, encouraging them to disclose how vulnerable their businesses are to a changing climate, to disclose the emissions, their responsibility to a changing climate. Um, and that's critical that those things are happening at Columbia. Um, so the analogy that I've been using more and more is, is really like a prize fight. You know, we're in the late rounds, there are two fighters, and on the one side of the equation, you have this very formidable foe. This is the rapid changes in climate, the potential for surprises, the huge vulnerability of our systems that we're learning more and more about. And we, I think, really do run a risk of a knockout <clears throat> punch, an uppercut punch from that fighter. The longer we go without reducing our emissions, the bigger that risk gets. But I think by the same token, there's another prize fighter that's getting much less attention, which is the potential for solutions, right? I think we've also underestimated the potential for a tipping point on the solution side. There's a positive narrative there. There's the potential for us to rapidly make changes that can get us off of the trajectory we're on. Um, and that's what we need to cultivate. That's another place Columbia can lead, solutions to climate change. Maybe there are levers to dramatically reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, for example. If you look at some of the things that are happening in a lot of parts of the world now, parity in terms of the price of renewables, wind and solar now costing less than it does to build a new coal power plant. Um, that's already happening in a lot of parts of the world. And I think the signal is beginning to get sent to businesses now that the place to invest is on the renewable side of things as you, as you think about those trajectories. We're opening the door to those kind of innovations. I think we're also seeing, as I mentioned earlier, investors um, beginning more and more to push companies to disclose uh, their vulnerabilities. Maybe we're also starting to see through leadership programs at Columbia like Sustainable Development, Earth Institute, cadre of young professionals that really demand sustainable practices um, in the businesses they, they, that they choose to go work in. So it's, it's hard to underestimate um, the potential for rapid innovation on the solution side. And I think Columbia can be right there through our connections to uh, the private sector, um, to industry, to insurance, um, to government, to help cultivate that you know, really rapid um, uh, tipping point, which, which could be a real um, transformation uh, as well. So I talked a little bit about mitigation. Um, I want to talk a little more about adaptation to climate change. This is something that um, Columbia is really putting a lot of emphasis on right now. We recognize that even if we dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, which we must do, there are already so many vulnerable communities. We're already locked into some additional warming. So with that in mind, Columbia has organized an interdisciplinary uh, team of scholars, social scientists, anthropologists, legal experts, members of the business school, um, including the, the, the core sort of climate science folks, around three key themes. We're looking at uh, cities like New York that are leading in adaptation. They've changed the whole narrative. You can't do impact assessment anymore. You can't think about what sea level rise is going to do for coastal flooding without thinking about adaptation anymore. That's how far New York City's gotten. We are building the green infrastructure solutions, right? We're starting to see more seawalls and things like that. You, that's the new reality. But the science is not there yet in terms of documenting all the strategies that are underway. What are the different agencies doing? Are these adaptation strategies going to work together or against each other? How much are these resiliency efforts post Sandy costing? Are they coming in under or over budget? Are they achieving their objectives? Those are key unknowns. You know, we basically have a test bed in New York City for testing these adaptation strategies. And we were right front and center in that work. Um, and we want to see how it can be applied to other parts of the world, other parts of the U.S. that don't have as much money, um, that don't have the potential to, to sort of mount some of these responses uh, to a changing climate. How can we help? Can some of those lessons be taught quickly? 
Another thrust, in addition to that sort of urban adaptation piece, is looking at developing countries around the world, their vulnerabilities to climate change. Can we help around some of the protected areas that have key indigenous um, uh, wildlife, that have human populations that are very vulnerable? Can we help with conservation in a way that actually supports ecosystems, but also supports adaptation, prevents heavy rain events, prevents the most warming? Those are key areas we're working in. A third theme is basically around retreat and resettlement, accepting that there are going to be some parts of the world, whether because of sea level rise or because this combination of high temperature and high humidity, it's not going to be as viable to live in those places in the future. At least some of those communities are too vulnerable. But there are so many steps involved that go far beyond how much the ocean is going to rise, how much temperatures are going to go up when we start to have the discussion of what to do. How do we organize a retreat from some of those areas? How do you do it in a way that the most vulnerable members of the community, who maybe have the least access to information, aren't left behind? Is there an orderly way to remove from ourselves from some of those vulnerable areas where you don't see a full collapse in real estate prices? Is there a way to plan ahead where those people are going to go so we're moving them to places that are less vulnerable? Can we move them to the cities of the future that are more sustainable, that require less emissions? You can see how these questions go so far beyond climate science. It's a broad engagement, and a dialogue um, across the university, but also far beyond. We realize at this point the limitations of what the university can do as well. Um, I think we're a key pillar here, but we're realizing more and more that um, a key part of that societal solutions tipping point is going to be all of you. It's going, to be, it's going to be all of us. We're learning how, through things like Columbia World Projects that the president has been leading, to engage with the decision makers, with those who have experience in the world of action, in the world of change. How can we support you? How can we provide the science in a way that helps you do the nuts and bolts of implementation, that helps you serve as levers of change, whether through the private sector or other things that you're doing? How can we support uh, that effort? I think that is our best hope at really coming up with that counterpunch on the solution side. It's a societal engagement where climate science and the university plays a role, um, but to really accomplish it, you know, I think it needs to be done at a societal level and, and you know, thinking about how we at Columbia can support um, some of the things that, uh, that you all are doing. So I'll close there, thank you. Okay, so I don't know about you, but I feel smarter and more confident than I did when the, when the morning began. Um, I love the prize fighter analogy because we need to be able to understand the challenges, but also the opportunities, um, that there are solutions and that we, uh, as a university uh, and part of the university community, have a role to play, whether it's in science, in the legal community, business, journalism, public health. Everybody is contributing. And that's your role as Columbia leaders. When you go back uh, to your clubs and to your schools to be able to communicate, to tell people that this video will be online so that they can, can learn about it. And, it. and it's really also, you know, I think part of the, the a key part of the role of the Columbia Alumni Association is to be able to enrich you for all eras of your life, all phases of your life, so that you're continuing to learn, you're continuing to be intellectually engaged. So I hope that that's a, a takeaway for you, but also that we as educated people uh, in the world and part of this great university can engage decision makers, that we all in various ways in the leadership roles that we we play in our communities and within the Alumni Association that we're able to have an impact on the conversation. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Domenico, who is Dean of Science for the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and in that role, oversees Columbia's nine science departments, including Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> he is the Thomas Alva Edison Con Ed Professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia. And he told me not to make his introduction too long, but how can you not say the Thomas Alva Edison Con Ed Professor? 
He is the founding director of Columbia Center for Climate and Life, and his research uses deep sea sediments as archives of past climate change. Professor Domenico. I think I'm mic'd up, yeah. <clears throat> um, so I wanted to first start off by thanking you, Alia, for, for uh, introducing us and hosting us. Um, realize the demands on your time, and thanks so much for being here today. Um, and also, it's a real honor for me to be up here with Kate and Radley. We have a lot of scientists that I was about to show you uh, at Columbia. Uh, these are among our best, and certainly among our best communicators. And really, if there's a take home message today, it's about this narrative of communicating and basically making what we see as an existential threat to humanity real to people at the ground floor. And that's where I'd like to take us today. Um, the, you know, I think the most important thing as far as Columbia is concerned is that we're really trying to accelerate this idea of accelerating science for solutions. What really matters is what are we going to do? And how can our collective intellects contribute to those solutions that will happen in our lifetimes? They have to happen in our lifetimes. So what I'm going to tell you about is uh, something that we started, actually it was an idea that kind of came to me in a funny place at a funny time, but we won't get into that, um, about five years ago. And uh, this is the Center for Climate and Life, and this is a uh, campus-wide, a Columbia-wide initiative that's really trying to mobilize the remarkable intellectual assets we have across campus to solve, to, to really lead solutions for, for uh, the climate problem. So uh, we know enough about me. Um, so as Kate mentioned uh, that uh, you know, when we look at a figure like this, this is the, the instrumental record of climate change. It's about 100 years long. And we see that it's going up. Temperatures are rising. And I would venture to suggest that nobody really cares about this graph. And I say that because no one really cares about this graph. No one is living this graph. This is an average of the overall temperature and is kind of roasting in a nice, you know, sort of gentle boil. But when we go to bed at night, this graph doesn't keep me up at night. What keeps me up at night, and the reason why I'm here, is this. Is that the reason that we care about this problem is because it impacts us in a very visceral, personal way. Personal meaning that you care as an individual because it impacts your access, the security of your access to the life's essentials, to food, to water, to shelter, to energy, to health. Now, it doesn't every impact each person on the planet equally in these different areas. Some people will be relatively immune to food security, whereas others, that'll become their existential reality. And so where we can inform this, where we can change the narrative, where we can really own the thought leadership on this and really shape uh, solutions, is by informing this on a place and time specificity that's been unknown up to the present. And Radley was alluding to this, so was Kate. And this is really the challenge that faces us for the decades ahead. So the first question that comes up, uh, this is actually a slide that I took from my presentation to the trustees about a year ago. And it was remarkable because <laughs> a number of the trustees didn't know this either. So I want to make sure that all of you know that Columbia University has the top ranked earth science program in the nation. You'll notice some of the other names on here. You've heard of them. There's Harvard, Berkeley, Caltech, Stanford, all the others. And MIT, amazingly, is off on the far right. Columbia has a top-ranked program in the nation, the graduate program. So right from the get-go, um, we have uh, established leadership on this. We also have the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which has a staff of about 500 scientists, all working on earth science questions. The Earth Institute, which is this connective tissue that links together all the assets, the, the law school, the business school, everything else. We have international reach because it's Columbia. And then here we are in New York in the center of, you know, it's a global center for business. So I think we're really well positioned to turn this knowledge to action through the university, through our, our relationship with the, with the global population. This is perhaps, this is actually what got me motivated to start the Center for Climate and Life, was something I called the uh, Climate Innovation Gap, and it's a really easy thing to talk about. If you just take some metric of 
what's been happening. This is just using global temperature, but we can look at sea level rise, we can look at agricultural yields, we can look at a lot of different variables. Basically, they're in flux. The Earth is warming. Our investment in understanding about what that means to us is tanking. The US investment in basic science has decreased by 50% since um, uh, a little bit before when I began my, my PhD studies. Uh, we're really, the US is not only divesting from it, it's been going on for decades, but the current administration's made it very clear, as all of you know, that climate science in particular has crosshairs on its back. And uh, you know, this, we, Lamont has been around for 70 years. Last year and this year is the first time in its history that it's ever had a negative, um, had, a, had a deficit. And next year looks worse. So we, we need to find a way to solve this. It's not just a Columbia problem. It's a full-on national intellectual crisis. <clears throat> the other thing is that we do this well. Uh, Radley was in the news just yesterday. Uh, I mean, we have just amazingly, uh, amazing presence in the news. We're uh, really leading the discussion on climate impacts on, on what people care about. So the essential approach that underlies this Center for Climate and Life, Climate and Life Initiative is to mobilize talent. So we have 120 PhD scientists. It's actually probably more like 150 if you, if you include all the cross-campus assets. But it's just a virtual army of incredibly bright people. Remember, this is the top program in the nation. And then we focus on how climate impacts people. We don't focus on the global mean trends. We focus on specific problems that they care about, food, water, shelter, energy, and health. Places that they care about, New York versus Shanghai versus Mumbai. We focus on timescales they care about. When we talk about the IPCC projections, this Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their target is 2100. That doesn't keep people up at night. If you talk to them about their 30-year mortgage and say that what's happening to them on that kind of a time scale, that's compelling. And we can do that. But it's not being done. So the first idea to get around is that this is not business as usual science. Yes, it is still science. Yes, it is still, um, we're still using the, the toolkit that we have, the people that we have. But our focus is to be urgent is to be impactful, to reward high-risk science, which is exactly what's not happening now, given the very tough funding um, uh, environment, to be innovative, and to really focus on this question of what can we do now, if money weren't an issue, what would we do now that would be different, that would really shape not only the debate, but shape the private sector to turn knowledge to action. And that's where we engage the private sector. And it's a lot easier doing it here than it would be here. <laughs> um, so I'll just give you an example of some of the work that goes on at Columbia. <clears throat> uh, so the climate impacts on food, it was alluded to in, in Radley's talk, but uh, some work by some of our scientists uh, here at Columbia has shown that crop yields, commodity crops, so this is the grain belts of the world, declined by about 5 or 10%. The yields declined by 5 or 10% for every degree of warming. Now you could say, but wait a minute, I know that crop production is going up, and I know that some prices are going down. What you may also know is that there are these sudden blips, these, these depressions in the, in the crop prices that occur when there are, um, or sorry, depressions in yields uh, when these heat waves come through. And this is what impacts flowering time and then the eventual maturity of the, of the crop itself. So what these are are short-term disruptions in, the, in, the, um, in crop yields and the price spikes. And then these ring like a bell throughout the global economy. This is uh, another uh, area that we've been focusing on, that as those carbon dioxide levels rise in the atmosphere and the Earth retains more heat, the, uh, the likelihood for heat waves to, uh, uh, to lead to extended drought and basically the denial of rainfall to the American West, this is just one place in the world where this is happening. Another place, very unfortunately, is the, is, um, uh, the Levant in the Middle East, where um, continental scale drought conditions become established uh, uh, by the end of this century. And this is already something that's underway. How do we know it? Because we can actually weigh the continental aquifers. There are two satellites that, well, there were two satellites, um, Grace, named Tom and Jerry, because one chases the other. 
and they chase, they go around the planet, and what they do is they measure the distance between these two satellites, and then when they go over something that has mass, if that thing is changing mass on a month-to-month -month basis, the gravitational attraction changes, and it can measure this. And so you can weigh the Central Valley Aquifer, you can weigh the Southern Great Plains Aquifer, you can weigh the Alabama aquifers. So anywhere we see red is where the aquifers are becoming lighter, they're becoming less massive, they're, we're, we're losing that storage capacity. <clears throat> um, we almost don't need to talk about this. You know, over the, the, the events over the last six weeks have shown us very clearly that the combination of sea level rise, a storm surge, and, um, and more destructive extreme events leads to uh, very significant loss. Uh, something in the realm of solutions that we're working on is in energy. Some of you may know that uh, we had an experiment that was a joint experiment with the Icelandic government where we took carbon dioxide that was emitted from power plants. And because Iceland, the entire continent of Iceland is made out of this rock called basalt, which is a very dark rock. You've seen it. It's on those coatings. Actually, if you go out on the streets, a lot of the buildings are sheathed with it. <clears throat> um, basalt is a rock that's not at equilibrium at the Earth's surface. And sometimes you'll see these white veins going through a black rock. Those white veins are calcite. What our scientists did was they developed a way to mimic nature so that you can pump, so you can collect CO2 from the atmosphere, liquefy it, pump it down to the basalt, and it turns into that white stuff, which is actually former atmospheric CO2. Man-made CO2 turned to rock. It's a process that hasn't been proved scalable yet. We had, this was only 10,000 tons, but we're looking to find a way to, to increase this by several orders of magnitude. There's enough of this kind of rock on the Earth's surface to react, to turn to stone, all of human emissions, now and into the future. <clears throat> so going from a nice happy solution to the misery index. Um, I put this in here only because actually, so this was a talk that was at Lamont just last Friday. Uh, all of you know what humidity feels like. Heat plus humidity makes this thing called the humidity index, otherwise known as a wet bulb temperature. There is a wet bulb temperature at which we die because you cannot sweat enough to evaporate um, when the temperature is so high. And your body temperature, core body temperature, increases and you can only <clears throat> sustain um, an hour uh, above uh, that temperature. Um, so at this heat index of 35, you know, I hit a slide with death on it, but it's there. This just shows you this gradation. This is for India today. So there's some places in India that have very unpleasant conditions, but not life-threatening. But as you go into the future, a big chunk of the country goes to basically becoming unsustainable, unlivable. And this is just one part. Uh, I gave this talk yesterday, or yeah, yesterday to a Chinese delegation. And there's another map for China that's um, almost as scary. So there's an urgent need for solutions. So some of you may have seen this. It's called Pasteur's Quadrant. This is an, an index of the quest for fundamental understanding. So this is basic knowledge on this one, and this is consideration of use. Um, my uh, chair, I suppose, is over here in the applied research for Thomas Edison, so inventing for humanity. And then this is basic physics, would be, let's say, Niels Bohr. The final, or the, the area where we're focusing on is here, which is this user-inspired basic research. It's the same idea of what we're doing. It's just having a mind to the end user. This is a, sort of a new way of thinking about science. It is not applied research. It is basically saying, what do people need to know now to shape decision making? This is not being done in part because the federal government has said, we're out of climate science. We're out of science altogether, but especially out of climate science. And so our way of getting around this has been to deploy philanthropic support. Our funding model is entirely to support science. Uh, so the, our, the idea is that everything that we raise goes immediately to people um, like, like Kate and to Radley and these 120 other scientists. We do this through uh, naming fellows. So people become a climate and life fellow for three years. So essentially what they do is they write a proposal, say I'm going to work on something that's relevant, urgent, and impactful, maybe even high risk. And if they are supported, I pay a third of their salary for three years, plus they have a research stipend as well. We make strategic hires. We contribute to startup funds for people that we want to bring to Columbia. 
Um, we do research support, technical support, we have conferences. So far, we've raised about eight million so far, and just to let you know, Columbia's not being passive about this. They put about three million into the pot to basically have skin in the game. So this is all within just the last year and a half or so. Uh, our target is, um, is, uh, is actually a couple of hundred million, but uh, just to give you an idea of the impact of our Climate and Life Fellows research, this is Chia Ying, who's a Climate and Life Fellow. She put this idea on the map. How many of you have heard the term rapid intensification before? So you've heard of her. <laughs> her research basically put on the map this idea of how storms are rapidly intensifying. That is, they go from a tropical storm to a hurricane in less than 24 hours. And that was rare before. It's more common now. It involves the warming of the oceans that's providing the fuel for these more intensive hurricanes. It just happened this morning, in fact, uh, right now with Hurricane Nate. Right now, Hurricane's right about here. Uh, it's largely dissipated, but the landfall was a category two. I think it's category two. Another thing that actually is pretty interesting is uh, this work that was done by uh, Jurg Schaefer and, um, um, uh, uh, and Gisela Winkler. This is uh, essentially, you've probably heard or read that Greenland is melting, and wherever you see the red, that's, it's melting around the Rhine, just like you would if you were defrosting a Thanksgiving turkey. It's doing the same thing. This is the loss in mass, actually measured by Grace. Remember Tom and Jerry chasing around? You can also weigh the Greenland ice sheet, and that's what this is doing. And it weighs less over time because it's losing mass, it's melting. And so the question arises, how sensitive is this whole ice sheet to melting? And you could say, well, that's unknowable. Or you could say, I want to come up with a really creative way to answer that question. And that's what these two scientists did. What they did was to use one of the rarest rocks that exists uh, in any scientific collection. So this is a cross section of the Greenland ice sheet. It basically sits like a big uh, lobe of ice in a, on a, in a basin. It's about uh, two miles thick. And at the very bottom of the ice sheet is bedrock. So you can ask a very simple scientific question. When was the last time in the middle of the ice sheet that rock saw sunlight? Cool question, right? And so the way that they answer it is looking at the ingrowth of something called cosmogenic nuclides, which can only be formed when that rock sees sunlight. So what they did is they uh, used a uh, drill hole that was done through an international scientific comp um, uh, 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 confederation of, of, of universities that drilled through the ice sheet, but then they did something that nobody else did. They, drove, they, they drilled another five feet into the bedrock, thinking this might be useful at some point. They didn't know why they were doing it. They just took it for posterity. <laughs> that sat in a collection for years. And then, and then these people said, I've got a tool. I've got the material. I want to find the answer. When was the last time this place saw sunlight? And they expected that the sort of million year time frame of these cosmogenic nuclides, that they would never have seen sunlight. And that was what we all thought until last year. What they discovered was that over the last one million years, a quarter of that time, there was no ice sheet on this, on this uh, surface. It saw sunlight for a quarter of the last one million years. Now, those are all natural climate changes, of course. But the fact that seven meters, 22 feet of sea level equivalent of ice is in play with us, talking about loading the dice, talking about playing with high risk odds, this is 20 feet of sea level. What Bradley was talking about was you know, a couple of feet, maybe a few feet. New York is preparing for six feet. This is 20 feet. So you know, this discovery of last year just blew away the scientists. And then you know, the policymakers are like, well, well, I don't know what to do with this. And the people who are making projections about future sea level rise say, the high end risk is actually a lot higher than we thought. The tail risk that Bradley was talking about is a lot higher than we thought. So <clears throat> what we're trying to do with the Center, of Climate for the Center for Climate and Life is to mobilize knowledge to action. That is to get these really smart people, this kind of brain trust, this Manhattan project of incredibly bright people to focus on this little red square of risk. That is, we want to inform how climate impacts things that we care about. And being in New York, 
If we weren't scientists, we would look at the same slide in terms of dollars and cents. And that is uh, what the Risky Business Project did that uh, Michael Bloomberg has led. And the number is roughly 1% to 2% of uh, GDP, or somewhere around 200 to $300 billion per year, and increasing. And you could say, no, 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 that's impossible. That's a huge number. No, no, no. Does anyone know the price tag for the four hurricanes that we've had so far, just this year? Does anyone know it? 200 million. Hurricane Sandy was 70. So it's not unreasonable. In fact, most economists think that's an underestimate. To put this in perspective, this is about a half to a third of our national defense budget. We all know how big that is, right? That's a big number. We're not, it's, and it's an annual number. So one of our implicit, uh, explicit linkages in the Center for Climate and Life is a partnership with the business school. I've met some uh, amazing economists there who have very similar viewpoints to what we feel as scientists. One of them here is in the room, Curtis Probst. It's really trying to mobilize not only the scientists, but also the people who are embedded in the center of business, which is here in New York. So we have a lot of people we can talk to, and I've been talking to them over the last couple of years. And I can tell you that uh, every single CEO or um, hedge fund manager that I've talked with takes my call, has a meeting, wants to remain engaged. I have not met a single person who said, I don't believe in this stuff, to go talk to someone else. So they get it. So we're not, you know, I'm actually very optimistic because I think when you actually get to the big money that's running the biggest investments, they get it. They just don't know what we know. And so what Kate and Radley and I and these 120 other scientists need to do is to let them know. And we let them know through focused research that we're not doing enough of. So our commitment, my commitment, is that we should be building from our strength. We've got a pole position on this. We should be innovative. We should take risks. We should be impactful. We have to partner with others. And we have to fund it like we mean it. This is not a $100,000 problem. It's not a million dollar problem. This is a $100 million problem. This is what the government is taking out of the system. Our, our Lamont budget is about 70 or $80 million a year. Fully one half to one third of that budget is under threat this year and next. So it's a, you know, we, we gotta get moving on this. And last, I'll just end it with this. This model works. This is how we found uh, the polio vaccine was a combination of public and pri private philanthropy, mainly from the Rockefellers, but then through March of Dimes, for those of you who remember those little orange boxes. Together, that public and private philanthropy was 25 times what the government was putting into pediatric virology at the time. And within 10 years, 15 years, the vaccine was found. And so by the time I went to school, no one in my class, save for one child named Martin, had polio. But my brothers did. So I've seen, we all know that this is a success story. In fact, this is one of the best success stories. And I think we can have the same one for climate. Thank you. All right, we wanted to end on an optimistic note, and thank you. <laughs> Polio in our time. Um, just, I just feel a tremendous sense of pride knowing that Columbia is the leading um, earth science program in the world. That means, that means a lot. So we're going to take questions. So we're we're going to bring chair, the chairs up, um, and Kate and Radley. Um, and Peter are going to join me up here. You know, I, I actually I have some questions, but I think we're we're sort of like we have just enough time to get questions from the audience. I'm sure that there are a lot of questions, and if I don't see hands, then I'll ask some of mine. But who raise your hand, and um, Doreen is going to bring the microphone up. So we'll start over here first. I know you had a question yesterday, so I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> it's always good. It's always good. Thank you to everyone. That and just please just... say who you are and, you know, maybe you're the school you graduated from and what your role is as a leader with CAA. Sure. My name is David Pung. I'm based in Hong Kong with the Hong Kong Club, uh, College 83. So thank you very much for the presentation. I think the, um, 
question most people would be interested in, how do you, as scientists, engage with the Trump administration? Is it hopeless? Is it uh, this man, we're not gonna change his mind? Or will there be some you know, positive opportunities to engage? <laughs> Nobody knows. I'll, I'll, I'll just say, I mean, engaging with them on a scientific level is impossible. Um, but engaging with them at an economic level is very possible. And I think that's where the rubber meets the road on this, is that um, there are some movements afoot that are, are allow an end run basically around what the government's trying to do. Because you just think about global international businesses and the amount of investment that they put in. Let's say they're putting in a new refinery and they've got a 30-year horizon. You know, Radley focuses on where are you going to site that place? And if, if, the, if the Trump administration says, hey, you can build it right at sea level if you want, you, you know, your, your advisors who are going to be talking to people like Radley and I won't let you do that. And so once we kind of build that level of engagement and trust, which is the base of what we do, um, that's how we move the needle. Okay. Hi, I'm Molly Moltato. I graduated with a joint degree in journalism and international affairs in 92, and I co-lead the Alumni Club of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And I have um, two related questions. One is, um, I've heard it's argued that the most effective way to deal with the greenhouse gases is to remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And the model you showed in New Zealand is factory specific. It's close to a factory. And there's another model that I've read about um, that's being run by another Columbia professor at Global Thermostat that's more atmospheric. How realistic is this as a, as a tool in mitigating climate change? So I, I can answer that one. So Peter Eisenberger hired me. So he's the one who's president of Global Thermostat. So um, they, uh, so they're, they're a successful and aggressive success story. They uh, secured 50 million in startup. They have customers, they have people who are buying their, so this is a company that's doing free air capture. They're actually, um, have any of you heard what a, a rebreather is? Do you know what a rebreather is? It's like a scuba tank that doesn't emit bubbles because it captures the CO2 from your breath. They, they basically use that same compound, they're called amines. And um, they basically have, they make artificial trees or like a wool that sucks carbon dioxide from the free air. You can put it in this room, it'll take down the carbon dioxide in this air. And they found a way basically to capture that CO2, liquefy it, and then, and then sell the effluent, to sell the CO2. So one group called Air, air Liquid, Liquid Air, um, the big company, they're a customer, so they're buying that CO2. And then, they won't say which, but a, um, a bottling beverage company has bought it. I think it's Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola will soon be having you know, Coca-Cola bottles that are carbonated with man-made CO2. Wow. Yeah, pretty, pretty slick idea. But you know, does it make a difference? No, um, sadly. I mean, that's you know, scalable, it makes a huge difference. And that's the, that's the reason why the turning it to rock makes a difference. Is that that's the only way you can get the, um, the storage capacity. And just the easy way to imagine is so imagine the extractive industry in reverse. That's how big it's got to be. I would, I would just add that the best way to get carbon dioxide out of the air is not to put it there in the first place. Yes. <laughs> Again, uh, thank you all for a very comprehensive presentation. I'm Frank Wong from Taiwan, um, Engineering School, 1996. Uh, we have two questions. Uh, first, uh, are you doing some collaboration with the engineering school for some innovative solutions, such as uh, energy storage, smart city, or maybe other things? Secondly, um, are you doing some work for earthquake predictions? Thank you. So I could say a little about um, some of the collaborations with the engineering school on the adaptation and resilience uh, side of things. Through the adaptation initiative that I mentioned, we're working with George Diodatus um, and some other folks in engineering who have a lot of experience uh, thinking about big infrastructure solutions, uh, large-scale seawalls, for example. These are folks who've gone in and looked at all the things that the MTA, for example, has done in New York post-Sandy from that rigorous engineering perspective um, so that we can compare some of those hard infrastructure solutions to alternate strategies that are more focused on maybe green infrastructure. 
new parks, um, and also some of the building level strategies we're seeing more and more of moving critical infrastructure out of the lower floor of, of buildings, getting some of those generators and electrical equipment uh, up to the roof. So I think in that resilient strategy perspective, the engineering schools are critical, both for the kind of traditional hard infrastructure, sort of visions of the city, but also thinking about some of these greener solutions where there's also a huge role for engineering school. I don't have as much to say on the mitigation uh, side, but certainly there's a lot, a lot happening there as well. Greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Yep, so the, I mean, so the engineering school is key in this. They're actually um, very, we had a meeting on Thursday with the president of NYSERDA. I don't know if you're familiar with NYSERDA, but uh, they're going on to talk with various universities about how the universities can participate in the energy revolution. And, so Columbia is starting a new center for battery research, um, and we're also we also have uh, a scientist in the Lenfest Energy Center who's working on this ca uh, carbon capture uh, idea. So uh, we also have a whole group that works on developing new uh, photovoltaic substrates. Um, that's actually some folks in our chemistry department. So the engineering school is dialed in. <laughs> yeah. well, the second question about the green Yeah, we do that too. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we have, we have an observational group, we also have um, uh, sort of a probability distribution group, you know, which regions are the most likely to be impacted. Uh, we work with reinsurers to inform their risk, so yeah. Okay. We'll go here and then there next. Yeah, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll, we'll do here. Then there and then here. <laughs> I'm keeping track. <laughs> uh, my name is Yanga, uh, PhD, 2015, very proud uh, grad of Lamont. Um, I have a question about communicating climate science. I uh, like uh, Kate's approach very much. You know, you bring it down to a very basic level. So my question is, uh, how do you go about trying to communicate the very basic, the fact of climate science to somebody who's a little defensive? Um, so. In sort of delving through some of the social science literature, the thing that has really surprised me is that as scientists, we always assume that people don't have the facts. And if we just find a way to tell them the facts, then they'll change their minds. And what the social science literature says is nobody ever changes their mind mm -hmm. in response to facts. Um, but what does change people's mind is when they trust the person who's talking to them and when they're receiving information that fits into a deep story or a narrative or the way that they see themselves. And the way that I think we overcome this is I think we all have to play a part because there are some communities that aren't gonna listen to me. Um, they see me, they see me as an outsider, they just don't care. But there are other people who can go into those communities and I think that's actually why it's so important to have a diverse group of scientists to draw on people from all backgrounds. Um, I myself um, write for um, On Being with Krista Tippett, um, mm -hmm. which is a publication, um, it's a radio show, and they have an online publication, which is sort of geared not towards science enthusiasts or climate change solutions, but faith communities. Um, and I find that to be like a really interesting environment to talk in. Um, but I think the answer to your question is we all have to play a part and we all have to make sure that our scientific workforce is drawing on a really wide range of people. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Omar Patrick. I am from GS13. I'm also a member of the uh, executive board for the Alumni Association. And one of the reasons why I'm here this morning, other than that I'm deeply concerned about climate change, and, you know, as a filmmaker, I take an anthropological approach towards everything, considering all human rights and human relations. And maybe, Radley, you can answer my question more directly. How serious is the retreat and relocation that we have to consider when it comes to this climate change? Because that, to me, because some people are actually embracing climate change, right? They're saying, our area is not going to be really affected. We're loving the sun over here. We're you know, so how, how how much of that do we have to take into consideration when it comes to retreating and relocating? Is it a new way to relocate this whole? I think it's something that absolutely needs to be front and center that hasn't been talked about enough. I mean, just to give a few examples, much of South Florida, 
even if you could imagine a reality where there's an endless supply of money, where everyone was willing to accept climate science immediately, there's some basic geophysical constraints. Even if you built that seawall, you basically have Swiss cheese underneath some of those areas. Limestone that the water is just going to rise up through. Basically, that's the sort of physical, intuitive example that actually applies in a much broader way. Because for most of the world, they may not literally have that Swiss cheese, but they're not going to have the money to build the seawalls. Already, you have more and more people moving into these vulnerable areas. Lagos, Nigeria, right? So by some estimates, a couple hundred right. thousand people like every year right. are moving into these vulnerable marshlands before you even think about the fact that the mm -hmm. sea is coming up. This has to become you know, more of the dialogue. And it's not just sea level rise, right? It's this high temperature and high humidity. Right. Some parts of the Persian Gulf, um, you know, this is gonna be this is gonna be a huge issue. Sub-Saharan Africa, areas where there's food security issues right now. Turn up the temperatures a little bit, even if rainfall would stay the same. We're concerned rainfall patterns are gonna change, but even if they stayed the same, turn up those temperatures, more soil moisture deficits. This has to be part of the discussion. And if we don't have the discussion in an active way now, it's gonna happen indirectly, right? It's food security issues, then conflict, then migration in a disorganized way, which actually increases the vulnerability so dramatically. So we need, I think, an aggressive program starting from the vulnerable populations from the beginning. I believe Columbia is right there to yeah. lead this. I only see one other university in the I'm US. Yeah. I only see one other university in the US that's showing a similar level of, of potential commitment. To is there enough room on Earth for us to relocate? <laughs> Less. Yeah, is there, is there gonna be space? Because to me, that's something to consider. Like, if we're gonna be relocating, where are we gonna be relocating to? Yeah. And is there gonna be population increase and then topsoil depletion makes it <laughs> something to really consider? Yeah. Yeah. You know? so, yeah, we don't know, fully know the answer to that question. I think it's ex the answer is extremely. I like asking questions. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> a key part of the answer is going to be how we live in the future. Do we do it in a way where we're performing agriculture in the right regions in a very uh, energy intensive way? Are we living in a way without a ton of sprawl? And wild cards are some of those mid to high latitude regions going to see more rainfall? Are they hopefully not going to see more extreme events? You know, we may need some optimism. We may need some things to break break our way, um, right. but we can't rely on that optimism. So we'll get a reading list at the end, So because we need to be able to move around. Thank you so much, though. We'll go here, and then here, and then we'll go to the back. Thanks. Hi, I'm Karen Kleena, Columbia Business School class of 1994. And as a personal Sandy downtown survivor, mm. um, really fun. But also as someone who, on the corporate side, um, at one point <clears throat> bid for congestion pricing in New York, which was totally killed. Um, I would like to get your current perspective with de Blasio and sort of where you see, you know, we're in New York, this is so great, but is it really? And really, where do you see some, some of the legislation and that link to the political side? Because I now live in Boston, I'm at the Columbia Business School Club of Boston and CAA board there, and you know, like the Kennedy School is having a lot of, hate to mention on the university, a lot of issues on this. And I, I think that political link and how that's really, I see that going in New York and the role Columbia can play with that. Can you comment a little on that? Um, yeah, I think, you know, I personally think, um, you know, it's a shame that we didn't see um, uh, more progress on the congestion pricing, just my personal um, opinion. I think, you know, one of the critical issues right now that we're seeing is the, the role of the non-state actors, right? That's, that's the issue right now at the state level, at the city level, NGO, private sector, uh, mobilizing. Um, and I think that you know, can be a powerful narrative. I don't know the specifics in New York um, right now, but I am uh, optimistic. I feel like the overall message is our goals towards greenhouse gas emissions actually being ramped up um, at the city level uh, and the state level relative to prior years, so that may open the door to more consideration of congestion pricing, although I'm not up to date on the, on the details there. Clearly there are powerful forces uh, against it. Okay. Hi, 
My name is Johanna Getzel, and my question is for Kate, actually. I know you didn't talk about it today, but the article that you wrote about um, the parallel universe of women in sciences, I was wondering if you could touch upon that. I did my master's in climate and society a few years ago, and at the same time, my partner was getting his PhD in sustainable development, and he and most of the men in his cohort are now working in academia, and a lot of his female colleagues in the same cohort are in nonprofits like myself or have moved on to different sectors, and I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, wow. Okay, um, so yeah, I um, actually got my PhD in theoretical physics, so I am a string theorist by training, um, and string theory turns out to not be a growth industry. <laughs> <laughs> so I um, came at climate science kind of from the side, um, and what I found actually is that um, when I was a string theorist, I would very, very often be the only woman in a room. Um, and. It's, it's hard, as you know, being the only woman in a room because you have to represent 50% of humanity. Um, <laughs> and, and that's hard. And I, I think a lot of people here you know, have had similar experiences. Um, the thing that I have found really amazing about being a climate scientist is there does seem to be a critical mass. Um, I am almost never the only woman in a room. And there's a real culture of humility. Um, so as a string theorist, as a physicist, you kind of have to pretend you know everything because that's what you're studying is everything. Uh, and in climate science, it, it's very, very, very common. It happens to me almost every day where you run up against something where you're like, well, I don't know, this, this might involve plankton. I'm going to have to go find somebody who studies plankton and go talk to them. And I think that culture of recognizing that this is an incredibly complex system and there are so many people with areas of expertise that we can draw on, that has created a culture of collaboration. And I think that makes it a very healthy culture in my personal experience. Mm -hmm. So Doreen, I know we, there were two people back there and I'm, I saw two hands back in the, thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Don Moster of the School of Professional Studies. And um, I guess the question really reaches out on, on that angle. We are, as a school, is producing an enormous resource of graduates at a very <laughs> rapid rate. And uh, I'm wondering how uh, we can be engaged in your efforts. I can speak a little bit to that. So we're just launching a new program uh, this year. It's a soft launch now and a hard launch next fall. Uh, for sustainability science, um, and that's a, a whole degree program that will uh, essentially be more science heavy than uh, the Masters in Climate Society at the moment. So it would be uh, for professionals that are wanting to go into be a little more heavyweight on the science, but as it relates to the questions that the three of us have been talking about today. So to that end, I mean, I think Columbia is being very proactive and surprisingly agile. You know, a lot of times the IVs are kind of very reluctant to change and adapt, and, but in, the, in the SPS, it's, uh, they are not that way. <laughs> okay, so we have time for two more questions, so come up here. Yes. We get microphones on its way. Did you, who are you? <laughs> I can only say that because we know each other. I can only say it in that tone. So. <laughs> um, I'm Moselle Thompson. I graduated from the college and law school. And uh, it's just an observation. And it's a challenge. And it's a place that kind of, I really respect the work that you're doing and the incredible science that you're engaged in. Um, <clears throat> It seems to me that one of the places that we're woefully underinvested, among a lot of others, but at least one that I think would make a difference and Columbia could bring some attention to, is this. We are woefully uh, underinvested in how we talk about this to regular people. Because, because it's science and because you have this perception that this only affects a bunch of rich people who live on the coast, that it seems like it makes it easy for people to discount it as either being not relevant to them or not believable. 
And it seems to me that we at Columbia could invest in two things. One is working with some of the professional schools about how we talk about this to the public. And second is to begin to educate policymakers in a way that makes it easier or simpler for them to advocate than to ignore. So it seems to me that that's a place where there's a gap. And it has nothing to do with the great work that you're doing. It's how it's perceived as sort of an elite issue instead of an issue that affects regular people. Thanks, Mozell. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely right. And that's why the Columbia commitment for climate response is so important. <laughs> That's why we need social scientists involved. That's why I think we need to be pushing this impact conversation in all these different directions so that we can engage with different communities, national security, public health, for example, that may not, in some instances, be as receptible, receptive to messages about ecosystems or, or trees changing, for example. So we're trying to capture it in a different way. I would add that we don't just need social scientists. We need artists and we need storytellers because people respond to stories. They don't respond to facts or figures. Okay. I've got just one, uh, I think, happy story on this or an interesting story on this that speaks to exactly your point. So uh, one of our Lamont board members, uh, Susan Holgate, invited me to go to this lunch called Nation Swell, which is a group of kind of influence makers. And one of the people who was at the table was a filmmaker. And he's making a film about Appalachia and how Appalachia is responding to the death of coal, which is a very real thing, it's not coming back. But it's so interesting because there are very, any, if any of you have read um, Hillbilly Elegy, uh, it's that story but on this modern take, which is that we're gonna, we're gonna solve this problem on our own. And so what they're doing is he's making a film on how these Appalachian towns are trying to take up um, uh, engineering jobs or, or uh, um, renewable energy deployment jobs, either installation, electrical work, and they're trying to be part of their own solution for their community. And it's turning out to actually be this really interesting sort of homegrown story that has nothing to do with the liberal elite. You know, it's just it's a natural solution to their problem and they're owning it. And it was just a, you know, the way that the filmmaker was describing it is such a compelling story. So if we could do that for other parts of the country, I think it would be great. So I think we, actually, we have one more? Okay. Who has the microphone? Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tiffany Wu. Uh, I'm a Barnard alum. Uh, I'm also on the board here at the Columbia Club of New York. Um, I just have a quick question because my interest is in the healthcare area. So as climates change, obviously, there, it affects uh, patient health, as you mentioned earlier. Um, are there any synergies or collaborations being done, let's say, with the uh, healthcare field or the health sciences group? Uh, because obviously when things change, people will get more disease or need newer treatments. Um, so I can speak to a, to a little bit in, in terms of the impacts of extreme heat. Um, we've been working with a, a series of uh, epidemiologists and, and other folks looking at everything from um, how vulnerability of populations is going to change in the future. It has to do with age, of course, pre-existing health conditions. Um, also looking at sort of neighborhood scale uh, factors that influence vulnerability, air quality, indoor temperatures, there's a lot of frontiers in those areas. Also on the adaptation side, um, to what extent are we going to see more cooling systems, uh, more warning systems of various types. All sorts of other initiatives across Lamont and Columbia. Uh, exercise outdoors, biking, and how that ties into air quality issues. And then Jeff Shaman's work, for example, uh, at the cutting edge of, he's both a climate scientist and an expert on infectious diseases. Um, so, so really pushing some of that modeling forward in, in a lot of ways. Those are, those are a few examples. Okay. All right. So, so thank you all very much. I'm going to get closing remarks, though. You know, I think I'm just now at the point where I want to keep learning more, and I think your questions reflect that. So I'm just going to encourage you to make sure you, if you haven't already read your Columbia magazine, to to read that and share it with um, with folks in your clubs and and in your schools. And I think I would just like to ask for um, closing remarks if there are any reading materials, videos that you think we should. 
uh, pay attention. I know that on this sheet it says um, that we can learn more by going to commitment.columbia.edu slash climate. But if you have any things that you think we need to consult, that we need to read, and if you just have any marching orders for us or, or closing thoughts. Start with Katie. Sorry. You want to start? I just start the real thing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess what I would, if, if I were to offer a take home for all of you, I would want you to know that Columbia as an institution, as a university, is, is committed on this. Um, in fact, one of the things that makes me most proud of being here is the fact that this is not about me, it's not about the three of us, it's not about science even. It's about a whole university mobilizing on what I think is the existential problem of, a, of the world. And um, that gives me immense pride and it gives me a lot of hope. And so, you know, the way that that can touch you, I think, comes from where you're from. But I think it's, uh, I think it's important to take that as, um, you know, a way forward for all of us. First thing I would say is watch Kate's TED Talk if you haven't seen it yet. Just take a look at that, it's fantastic. Um, sort of along the lines of what Peter was just saying about the societal tipping points and how quickly uh, things can change. Just one example, we've been doing some research on how uh, extreme heat can impact the aviation sector. Um, and initially, basically the idea being that with higher temperatures, it's much tougher for planes to get lift the air is less dense. Runways aren't long enough for planes to take off fully loaded. Initially, it was crickets you know, from the airlines, um, from the engineers. Nobody was really engaging with us, at least, around that research. Um, and we speculated as to why. But we're starting to see a little bit of signs now, um, just in the last few months, as there's been more media coverage. That may be part of it, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. some airlines reaching out on the topic. Of course, that can be because we don't have all the information. We, as climate scientists, can't do the impact assessment. They know the <coughs> actual weight of their planes, how they're actually taking off. They have the best sense of what the adaptation strategies are gonna be. If we can get involved in that discussion and encourage that industry-led discussion, that opens the door to the much more important question, because the really critical question isn't how is climate impacting its av aviation, it's how is aviation impacting climate. Mm -hmm. right? 6% increase per year in greenhouse gas emissions associated with airline flights. We have no alternative fuels right now that can replace that. So you get in the door to start that discussion, we can get, lead to bigger discussions. Okay. I would just say um, it's so easy to kind of be tempted by despair. You look at all the things that are going on and you know people like us show up and say, this is an existential threat and all these terrible things are projected to happen. And it's really easy to lose hope. Um, but for me, the interconnectedness and the massive scale of the problem is kind of a perverse reason to hope. Because climate change happens in the world that we make. Um, and now there is almost nothing on Earth that isn't somehow touched by humans. And a world in which we have strong institutions, a world that's more just, a world that doesn't squander so much talent, I think is a more robust world. And so whatever you're going out and doing to make the world a better place, in so doing that, you are actually making the world more resilient and more easily able to adapt to climate change. So take hope from that, I think. Thank you.